started with the uh, with the talk tonight. Um, I'll hand over to Valerie uh, Peacock, our development director, who will just talk a little bit more about Friends uh, and what we've got coming up, uh, just to give you forewarning of uh, some events later on in the year. So Valerie, over to you. Great. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to all of our friends coming, all of the newcomers, and everyone who's turning in at different time zones today. So just a quick update on our friends program. We launched this on March 1st. And as of today, we have 52 members who are showing their support to the museum. If you're a friend, you will have already received your digital newsletter. This is the very first one that we've sent out. Um, so we'd really appreciate your feedback on maybe what you liked, maybe what you would like to see more incorporated in the next newsletter, which will go out in November. Our next Friends event is actually going to take place in person. It's going to be on October 7th at Wrexham Hightown Barracks. It's going to be called RWF Fest, and it's going to be a full day event of interactive and engaging presentations focused on the Fusiliers in World War I from various perspectives. We're going to host a fantastic <laughs> hands-on display of regimental uniforms through the <laughs> as well, and a pop-up exhibition of some items from our reserve collection. We have other programs planned for the rest of the, the year, so be sure to follow us on either our social media or sign up for our monthly e-blast so you can stay updated and be the first to kind of grab tickets for some of that. Um, and we're already kind of thinking about our programming lineup for next year, and we want to make sure that we're complementing the interest of our friends. So if you have a particular topic or something that you're interested in seeing, you could do, all you have to do is just email me. We're collecting a nice massive list so we can see what it is our friends really want to see from us next year, and we can start implementing that. If you don't have my email, I'll drop it in the chat, um, as well as a link to our friends group or how to sign up to our e-blast if you're not part of that as well. We're going to have time for questions at the end of the program. To do that, you can either use the raise your hand feature on Zoom, which is you just raise your hand and it like sees you raise your hand, and you'll it'll do a test on here and you'll see it and it'll pop up um, and then we can kind of do questions like that. Or if for some reason that's not working for you, you can just kind of wave your hands around and we'll see you. Um, or you can drop a question in the chat um, and I'll collect those toward the end and I'll ask them for you. But we hope you enjoy tonight's program. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to let us know. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Um, so it falls to me to introduce our speaker um, tonight, um, Anne Pedley. Uh, Anne and I actually were contemporaries at Bangor University uh, in the 1980s. Um, sadly, we didn't know each other then, uh, but we got to know each other uh, much better later um, in our uh, respective careers. But Anne has been an English literature teacher and lecturer. Uh, she was the archivist at the RWF Museum for uh, a number of years and also a long-term trustee uh, and hugely um, valuable contribution to the museum over many years. Uh, she's also the author of an excellent uh, booklet, which was sponsored by Welsh Government on the Welsh at Gallipoli uh, to commemorate uh, the centenary of, uh, of that campaign, uh, and also curated the Quarry Boys exhibition, uh, which was a travelling exhibition around Wales, uh, which told the story of the Pemama recruited company from 6th RWF who fought at Gallipoli uh, in Egypt and Palestine. So tonight her subject is um, the literary regiment uh, and I can think of no better person to um, lead us through this. Uh, we are extremely uh, proud of our literary um, heritage uh, and I'm sure um, Anne is going to give a tour de force of that uh, this evening. So Anne, with no more to do, uh, okay. I'll save your blushes. Um, and, uh, <laughs> There's lots of them at the moment. Carry on. <laughs> Okay then, uh, well, I think I must also do my welcomes as well. Uh, hello to the friends and hope, hopefully uh, guests as well that may become friends in the future. Um, I would like to thank the RWF uh, Museum Trust and the trustees as well, uh, because without them, I couldn't have put this talk together. Uh, I'd certainly like to thank Valerie. Thank you for all the techie stuff and support and Nick for introducing me. Uh, just one little thing uh, to, to mention is that throughout the talk I've used, as you can see, the W-E-L-S-H spelling of Welsh because it was uh, the most common one in World War One, and, and the, um, the, the, um, the act didn't come in 
into force until the 1920s uh, that, that sort of turned it into W-E-L-C-H. So it's as simple as that, really. It's just World War One. Um, so uh, this follows on from General John's talk, who did a fantastic introduction to the regiment, the history of the regiment. And in that talk, he referred to the fact that Nick has just said that we are a literary regiment, very well known for our authors and poets. And tonight, uh, an hour or just under an hour, will never do justice to the topic as a whole. But I do hope that I can introduce you a little bit for those that have perhaps uh, not too much knowledge about the poets and authors, uh, a little bit more about them. And also I'd like to, for those that do know, to maybe remind you as well. So without further ado, let me go on. And I start with that wonderful picture of what I think is the most fantastic monument on the Western Front, uh, the Welsh dragon that commemorates the men of the 38th Welsh Division at the Nets on the Somme. Okay, so hopefully this is gonna move. All right, there we go. Now, General John uh, said that every regiment has its own customs and peculiarities, and he did mention the goat. This is a goat that was out on the Western Front at some point. Uh, there is that peculiar St. David's Day ceremony of eating the leek, and I'm afraid these two lads here look as though they're pretty much, uh, uh, well, you know, not too keen on eating the rest of them, I think, and those are jolly large leeks, so that's for St. David's Day. Mm -hmm. uh, the flash is another one of the particular things that the regiment is associated with, and also we're going to talk now about the poets and the authors uh, in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers that, that joined the regiment uh, in the Great War, 1914 to 1918. And if you're wondering what that big gun is and where it is, it's a Turkish gun, I think firing onto the Dardanelles or outside of the Dardanelles, uh, when we were able to go on a regimental trip in 2015 to commemorate uh, the regiment's part at Gallipoli as well. So um, a little bit of stats first, uh, Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Well, uh, when war broke out, the 1st Battalion had a fantastic posting, I think, to Malta. They'd arrived there in January 1914 and uh, presumably were enjoying themselves in, in the beautiful island in the heat. Uh, until war broke out in August. The 2nd Battalion had had a long time uh, association with India, uh, but they had come back from India in 1914 and they were at Portland, Dorset. Uh, and um, if you want to read a little bit about what life was like uh, in the battalion, uh, please do pick up a copy of Old Soldier Sahib by Frank Richards, uh, who tells us the story of his service there in India. The 3rd Battalion was a Special Reserve Battalion, and that was at the Regimental Depot at Wrexham, which I always think of as the spiritual home of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. We still go there for our meetings, and it's got a huge amount of history attached to it as well. And after the reforms uh, in 1908, uh, uh, we had uh, several territorial battalions, uh, the 4th Denbyshire, the 5th Lynchshire, the 6th Carnarvonshire and Anglesey, and the 7th Merioneth and Montgomery Territorial Battalions. And they were thriving battalions, and I know this because my own local uh, battalion here, uh, um, territorial group here in Pemoma, uh, really did enjoy uh, being part and parcel of, of being part of these army territorials as well. Um, the Royal Felt Rail, get my tongue straight. The Royal Welsh Fusiliers uh, in the Great War. Um, Peter Crocker, a former curator and a good friend of mine um, uh, for the uh, museum, uh, made up this list for me that uh, I could, uh, could, could refer to um, about really how many battalions and such like served during the Great War. So 42 battalions served during the Great War. There were two regular battalions, the first and the second. We've mentioned four of the territorial battalions uh, on the previous slide, uh, which had second line battalions as well. There were 11 service battalions. So those were the people that answered the call to arms, uh, Kitchener's call to arms. Uh, and later on conscription, four garrison battalions and 19 home battalions. And that should tot up uh, to what Colonel, Pre uh, Colonel Crocker has, has put down here. So we had battle honours in the Great War, 88 battle honours. That's a huge amount to add to the ones that we already had for the regiment. For France and Flanders, there were 63 battle honours. For Macedonia or Salonica, uh, as it was known then, three. 
Italy three, the first battalion were uh, in Italy uh, towards the end of the war, rather forgotten front. Gallipoli five, Palestine eight, and Mespot on Mesopotamia four. Only three other regiments were identified by Peter that had more battle honours, and that was the Middlesex Regiment, who had 93, and of course had a huge pool uh, of, uh, uh, of recruitment uh, from London and, and without. Uh, Hampshire Regiment 91 and the Royal Fusiliers, same, same uh, as the uh, Middlesex. So we're called the Poets Regiment because we're going to highlight the poets and um, authors that we have here. And this wonderful picture here shows us five of them to start off with. If we look at the top left, I think many of you will recognize that that is Siegfried Sassoon, uh, uh, author and poet. Um, his uh, Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man ends with the beginning of the war, and he takes up the whole story in Memoirs of an Infantry Officer. If we go to top right, we've got Frank Richards, uh, the complete opposite. He's a, a ranker. Uh, Sassoon was an officer and he wrote uh, Old Soldiers Never Die and Old Soldier Sahib that I refer to as well about his time in India before the First World War. Middle, we've got a very young Robert Graves there and a book that I always recommend to anyone that wants to start reading about the First World War is Goodbye to All That. He's also a poet as well and his poetry we will come across uh, a little bit later on in the talk. The bottom left might not be so familiar. Uh, he's a local boy to me because he was born uh, not far from Colwyn Bay, Llandriff Lauren Rose, or lived there, I should say. And that is Llewellyn Wynne Griffith, who wrote, again, what I think is one of the best books in, in uh, uh, war literature, uh, Up to Mehmet's. And on the bottom right is David Jones, who may be better known as an artist rather than an author. And he wrote in parenthesis, uh, and certainly that, that is a book that's quite, quite a, a difficult read, but will give you uh, an amazing aspect, a modernist aspect on the First World War as well. So perhaps those are five of the better known uh, poets and authors for the Poets Regiment. Um, Less known outside of Wales is Ellis Humphrey Evans, uh, who is known with his bardic name, Heath Wynn. Um, and he joined the, the 15th London Welsh. Uh, we'll hear more about him later on in the talk. And his poetry is predominantly in Welsh. Uh, it's not got a huge audience outside well, Wales, but I would say that he is probably the national war poet of Wales himself. So we'll learn a little bit more about him later on. Uh, the War the Infantry Knew, uh, this wonderful fellow here with the moustache is Captain John Churchill Dunn. The War the Infantry Knew is a huge book that he put together from uh, um, memories, reminiscences, diaries, letters, etc. from those that survived the Great War in the 2nd Battalion. And he put it all together uh, in one big, huge book, including Sassoon's uh, memories as well. He was great friends with Sassoon. And uh, it's possibly not a book that you would pick up and read from page one to the end, but it is absolutely the Bible for anybody that wants to know what life was like for a battalion from 1914 to 1918 on the Western Front. You can learn so much from it. It's, it's an unbelievable read. It really is. Uh, uh, then we have another author, again, not so well known, Bernard Adams, who was attached to the 1st Battalion. And I'll come on. Uh, he wrote a book called Nothing of Importance. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about him a little bit later on. And he's very important for an incident that happened on one night of the Somme, which we'll discuss in another section. Um, in order to understand war poetry, we need to understand that there were changes going on in society and poetry and writing always reflect what, what these changes are. So since the turn of the century, a lot less emphasis was put on high Victorian long narrative poetry, such as Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade. It's a very long poem. It, it is an amazing poem, uh, but he was not there to witness the event. So he had to sort of make up what he wanted to put in the poetry through reading about it on an outer level. Uh, and the changes were that very much like the Romantic poets 200 years ago, they looked to a simpler style. Uh, and this style would, would have an emphasis on nature and truth. It was Keats always says, beauty is truth. And that was reflected 
really in the poetry of Rupert Brooke, uh, who was one of the cheerleaders for a group called the Georgians. And it culminated in his very short sonnet, The Soldier. And The Soldier is an absolutely excellent sonnet that has been sort of um, put down over the years because uh, people feel it's a little bit too jingoistic. But as you'll see from, from the next slide, he's really only reflecting what people thought at the beginning of the war. And I'm sure that the line, you know, there is a foreign field that's all for forever England, Wales, Scotland, Canada, New Zealand, whatever. I'm sure that that brought comfort to, to many a family whose, whose uh, sons and fathers did not come back from the war. Um, so this change in writing to a much simpler style, uh, to a style that emphasizes the truth or the actual that you've actually uh, experienced the truth, this sets the scene for the poets to emerge from the horrors of the trenches and the battles of the First World War. Um, there's never really been a, a soldier's voice uh, in poetry. Uh, apart from Rudyard Kipling, and he, of course, has suffered over the years as well from being jingoistic or empire or whatever. Uh, and, but Rudyard Kipling made a good attempt in Barrack Room Ballads to put forward the, the life of the Tommy in India. And Tommy, of course, is associated with, with our name uh, in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers for, for the Ordinary Soldier. So you know, his poem for it's Tommy this and Tommy that and chuck him out the brute but it's saviour of his country when the guns begin to shoot. And it's Tommy this and Tommy that and anything you please. And Tommy ain't a blooming fool. You bet that Tommy sees. So he was a voice. He certainly was a voice uh, for the ordinary soldier pre-World War I. And that voice became much louder as the war progressed. 1914, start of the war. And the attitudes to war that were developing in the poetry of the time, well, Kipling, despite being the voice of the soldier, writes a very jingoistic poem for all we have and are. And of course, his attitude changes immensely when his own son uh, uh, is killed at the Battle of Luce uh, in 1915, and his, his attitudes to war completely change. Thomas Hardy, uh, maybe we associate him more with being a, an author, but uh, after uh, writing Jude the Obscure, he never Never wrote uh, any novels anymore and he he continued to write poetry which he had done before his novels he wrote the poem men who march away uh, Rupert Brooke uh, again perhaps a bit idealistic one of the the sonnets one of the five sonnets was now God be thanked that has matched us with this hour so uh, he was also escaping from a rather uh, complex love affair as well so maybe that that was more uh, personal than anything else uh, Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen and Robert Grays, before they had any experience of the trenches, wrote in a similar style. Their poetry had yet to develop because they hadn't witnessed the horrors of war. So you can read Siegfried Sassoon's In Barracks, uh, Wilfred Owen's Arms and the Boy and Graves' The Last Post if you wish to get a, a, an idea of how their poetry changed from 1914 uh, to 1918. There was one very popular poet and uh, Wilfred Owen does refer to her in his poem which we'll look at later on, uh, Jessie Pope. And these really were very jingoistic sort of poems at the time. The type of tone that people like, though, she immensely popular, uh, immensely wealthy as well, out of poetry. She wrote three volumes of war poetry, including The Call, and here's a little flavour of it, if you, if you like that sort of thing. Who's for the khaki suit? Are you, my laddie? Who longs to charge and shoot? Do you, my laddie? Who's keen on getting fit? Who means to show his grit? with you, my laddie. And that's quite a long poem, and I think that's probably enough of it there. But that gives you a little example that in 1914, the war was popular. Uh, if wars can be popular, people accepted it. Uh, everybody thought it was going to be over by Christmas, another quick war, we could all go back to being uh, the British Empire again uh, and wait for the next one to come along. So uh, this is a postcard that was mass produced uh, in uh, 1914 by a very sort of uh, uh, perceptive uh, postcard maker. And everywhere that uh, people were sent to train, you could buy one of these postcards. I think this one came from Northampton and it would have hurrah for the, and this in this case, it's a Royal Welsh, 
Uh, they were selling them in Carnarvon when the Accrington Pals were training there, and you could buy them in Carnarvon that said hurrah for the Accrington Pals as well. So that gives you also an idea that the war, you know, it's a cartoon, the Kaiser's been chased off by an ordinary Tommy, and the war was going to be over with pretty soon. You know, nobody, nobody had any idea that we were going to have just over four years in the trenches. Um, this is Captain Loscombe Law Stable. Uh, he's not a, a, a poet or an author that's been published or anything like that. And you can see by his uh, dates, 1886 to 1914, uh, that he did not survive the war. But I've included him because uh, his parents published a memorial volume. And these weren't unusual in the First World War, less so in the Second World War. Uh, they published a memorial volume of his letters, some of his photographs and such like. And if we just look at one of the letters here, a very short one, uh, it also, I think, sort of exemplifies the attitude that, 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 that uh, Loscombe Law Stable was a regular soldier. He'd been to India with the 2nd Battalion. There's a fantastic picture of him in, in the archive uh, with uh, four polo players. They won the Polo Cup. Sadly to say, three of them did survive the war. Uh, and this is what he writes to his father in 1914. His father was a judge in Mid Wales. So uh, I got in here last night, dear father, after the hardest time I ever hoped to have. We were sent right up from the base to the front and during the last five days we have marched over 120 miles. So he's referring to the retreat. I've lost all my possessions as our kits were thrown away to lighten the carts and my compass was lost on one of our sudden right moves. Now he's very upset about this compass because in the previous letter his father has said don't lose that compass, you'll be in trouble if you lose that compass. So Captain Stable was killed in action a rather nasty battle, uh, not that well known, uh, within uh, First Ypres at La Cadonnery Farm on the 26th of October. October 1914. But he did have time to actually leave us with a little bit of literature here. And uh, again, this is from the memorial volume. So it's, uh, I don't know if the original still exists. But again, it shows you the sort of rather happy go lucky attitude that people had, uh, or young subalterns had, or captains had, really. Uh, and the feeling that the war was going to be over by Christmas. And this is, uh, this is quite popular at the time, you see quite a few of them, uh, and it's an alphabet, and I won't go all the way through it, but if you just look at it, this was written by A is an alphabet, written, written by Stable, under the heading, good manners at table, B for the bones that the warts get to eat, that's subaltern's C, senior captain grown fat on the meat, D is a word that is often employed by every officer when he's annoyed, so on, so on, so on. And uh, his parents included that in the memorial volume as well. And we get an idea because they put a little uh, legend onto it, who the people were that he was talking about as well. So that's the memorial volume is in the archive and can be referred to as well. Um, right, well, the war wasn't over by Christmas, but one of the major uh, events that happened was the Christmas truce. Some years ago in the archive, we had a fantastic exhibition at Boggle Witham Castle uh, about the Christmas truce, and the RWF was one of the uh, regiments that took part in this amazing thing that happened along the line in 1914. So the London Illustrated News shows us the, the meeting in no man's land and here is a German soldier with one of the little Christmas trees that the Kaiser sent out to his men on the front and tentatively people are coming up behind him. Uh, to, to make themselves known. And so there was exchanges of gifts, football, general fraternizing and such like as well. And it is recorded, of course, by our authors and our poets. So Private Frank Richards in Old Soldiers Never Die tells us, uh, we mucked in all day with one another. There were Saxons and some of them could speak English. By the look of them, their trenches were in as bad a state as our own. One of their men mentioned he had worked in Brighton for some years and he was fed up to the neck with the damned war and would be glad when it was all over. Is that quite perceptive? Uh, Mervyn Strange Richardson, a uh, favourite of mine, I've been editing his letters for some years as well, uh, and his uh, uh, bits and pieces. As you can see, he didn't survive the war, 1894 to 1916. Now, he wrote this poem that was apparently published in the Daily Mail, but I've never been able to find it. If any of you are very good uh, Sherlock Holmes sleuths, please do have a look if you can see if it's in any of the newspapers uh, archives. Uh, and he wrote, "'Twas a frosty Christmas morning, 
morning in our trenches on the lease and the fog was hanging thick along the fields. You could hear the Boches singing, but no Christmas bells were ringing, except the twinkle of the bullets on the shields. When the fog at last had lifted and the Boches' glances shifted, on our parapet in front of them they saw, from the men that they were fighting, Merry Christmas and the Kaiser's heads galore. So again, we still got this sort of almost, you know, schoolboy attitude to it or whatever uh, and they're, 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 they're composing little ditties and such like as well and there's Mervyn up to his waist nearly in the trenches at Frellingheim uh, the Germans were by uh, the brewery uh, and we were on the other side in uh, of the, the, the trench system of course not by the brewery and they brought over lots and lots of beer and we gave them plum puddings instead. So you can read about that in uh, Old Soldiers Never Die. And you can also, this is Captain, uh, he was Captain then, Clifton English Stockwell. You can see he's certainly gone a bit further than that as a Brigadier General at the end of the war. He's one of my favourite, uh, I can't say characters because he was a real man. Uh, and he's known uh, as Buffalo Bill in Frank Richard's uh, memoir. Uh, and his, um, his second in command was known as Dead Eye Dick. So uh, for reasons it would be too long to go into here but he certainly deserves a talk all of his own now he also um referred to to the incident on christmas day and his uh, memoir of the day uh, can be seen in the regimental records of the royal welsh fusiliers so you, if you've got that to hand you can read about it there's lots of it in there by him I think I have spent one of the most curious Christmas days I or anyone in the company has ever spent. Well, about 1 p.m. the fog cleared. The Saxons began shouting, don't shoot, we will bring you some beer if you will come over. The three Saxons climbed over the parapet and bundled a barrel of beer over to us. Then lots of them appeared without arms. And of course, our men showed themselves. Now, Captain Stockwell had strictly forbidden anyone to get out of the trenches that day. But I think the idea of a barrel of beer coming over uh, was, was probably uh, nothing could be done to, to stop them. Uh, 1915. I know we're going through this rather fast, but, but as I said, an hour will never do justice and we do have to move on. So 1915 is a war of attrition in the trenches. And we have these terrible battles that nothing goes right, really, uh, for, for the Allies. Right? The 10th of March, we've got the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle. Uh, in April, uh, 22nd of April, we've got 2nd Ypres, the first time that gas is used by the Germans. The 25th of April, we've got the landings at Helles, at Gallipoli, the death of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Doughty Wiley, uh, Victoria Cross, Royal Welsh Fusiliers. 9th of May, Battles of Oberst Ridge, which is a continuation of Neuve Chapelle. And then the 15th of May, the Battle of Festiburg, where we get our second uh, Victoria Cross as well. Uh, so the 10th of August, we go back to Gallipoli. The 10th of August is a terrible day for North and Mid Wales. It's by far the blackest day in the entire war. Uh, not the Somme, not Passchendaele, not, not the 1918 battles. The 10th of August is terrible for North and Mid Wales. Uh, it's more casualties because of the territorial battalions in the 53rd Welsh Division. And then on the 25th of September, we have the Battle of Luce. And here we've got a little picture of the uh, 15th uh, Battalion, London Welsh, training at Clandidno. And most of that looks pretty much the same, I think, today. Uh, in Northamptonshire, that's the 6th Battalion parading, I think, at High and Ferrers. Uh, and they're off to uh, Gallipoli, as we see here. So the 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th Battalions of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers never served on the Western Front. 5th, 6th and 7th uh, went on after Gallipoli to um, Egypt and Palestine. And the 8th went on to Mesopotamia. And there's, there's a huge amount of information and stories uh, there. Uh, on our 1915 trip to Gallipoli, I was able to take a little bit of quarry back to the quarry boys and I left it at La La Barba as a tribute because they did die a long way from their beautiful mountain home as well. That's the story of the quarry boys for another time. Um, not much formal poetry appeared from Gallipoli, but 
for some reason, Souvla Bay got people writing and they're more like ballads. Uh, and this is uh, by Sergeant W.R. Williams from Hollyhead. He was with the 6th Battalion. And he says, "'Twas on a Monday morning, I'll never forget the day. It's written down in history as the landing of Souvla Bay. The shrieks of shells and shrapnel and bullets flying past as comrade after comrade was falling by me fast. And as the sun was setting on the horizon far away, there was many a comrade missing on the shores of Suvla Bay. That's a very long poem. It's about four pages long. Um, now, uh, Robert Graves. We've already spoken about old soldiers never die. So we're going back to the Western Front now after Gallipoli. Uh, and Frank Richards introduces the reader to the arrival of a very new subaltern, Robert Graves. Uh, and this is when the 2nd Battalion is in trenches at Lavante. We had a young officer named Mr. Graves join the battalion at this time, and he was posted to C Company. He was soon highly respected. Graves recalls the event himself in chapter 13 of Goodbye to All That, and proceeds to provide the reader with an invaluable account of what life was like in the trenches prior to the battalion going into action at Cambrin near Luce in chapter 15. And this is real war, because here he, rega he recounts the death of Captain Samson. Captain Arthur Leg Samson was a professional soldier, born in London on the 1st of June, 1882, educated at Eton, Merton College, Oxford, and he played cricket. He had a, a cricket blue, I think, for his college. Joined the RWF in 1904, and like Frank Richards, he served in Burma and India with the 2nd Battalion, and he also embarked for France, August 1914, almost immediately mentioned in dispatches, 1915, and later awarded the uh, the Military Cross uh, on the 23rd of June of that year. He's killed in action on the 25th of September 1915, which is the opening day of the Battle of Luz. Frank Richard and Robert Graves both write about his death in their memoirs, but Robert Graves now produces a poem, and this poem is based on horrific experience. There's a picture of uh, um, uh, Samson, uh, by uh, Charles, I can't remember, there is another name, Lewis Charles Poles, isn't it, who I don't know a huge amount about. He wasn't a portrait painter, so on the whole, he was a landscape painter, but uh, I think the family may have known him, and that that is one of the uh, um, uh, portraits that we have in the archive. And this is what Graves says uh, about Samson in Goodbye to All That. Uh, Samson was lying wounded about 20 yards away from the front trench. Several attempts were made to get him in. He was badly hit and groaning. Three men were killed in these attempts and two officers, and two men were wounded. Finally, his own orderly managed to crawl out to him. Samson ordered him back, saying that he was riddled and not much worth rescuing. He sent his apologies for making such a noise. As soon as it was dark, we all went out to get him the wounded. The first dead body I came across was Samson's. I found that he had forced his knuckles into his mouth to stop himself crying out and attracting any more men to their death. He also wrote the poem, The Dead Fox Hunter. Samson was a, a, a very much, the, the, the army always enjoyed fox hunting uh, prior to days when it was considered maybe not quite right. Uh, so The Dead Fox Hunter, uh, he wrote, Graves wrote, we found the little captain at the head. His men lay well aligned. We touched his hand stone cold and he was dead and they all dead behind. Had never reached their goal but they died well, they charged in line and in the same line fell. The well-known rosy colours of his face were almost lost in grey. We saw that dying and in hopeless case for others' sake that day, he'd smothered all rebellious groans in death. His fingers were tight clenched between his teeth. So there you get the realism of war. In fact, uh, in the Cambrian churchyard, you can see the graves all lined up together with Captain Samson's, I think, in the middle. Uh, that's a lovely memorial here. Uh, it's not far from Utoxeter. I can't think of St. Leonard's Church. Beautiful memorial that's in one of the churches. And then let me move on, as I said, a little bit quickly, because time follows us. Uh, a meeting of two 
great war poets and great in sense of the great war and great as poets as well. On the left hand side, you see a photograph which we have in the archives. And this was taken after, uh, if, if we look at Sassoon's diary, after a night out uh, in Amion. And the gentleman top is Lieutenant Greaves. The middle is Captain Costa. Uh, you'll recognize Siegfried Sassoon, uh, top right. And at the bottom is Lieutenant Conning. And I'm not quite sure where in the revels they managed to find what I think is a goat or a sheep. Anyway, uh, the picture looks very happy, but there's a sad ending to it as well. Two of the men did not return from the First World War. Uh, Captain Costa and Lieutenant Conning were killed in action. So soon we know survived the war. Perhaps the saddest story uh, as well as Lieutenant Greaves was, uh, Sassoon tells us that he was an excellent musician who had studied under Ralph Vaughan Williams. Sadly, he lost an arm in 1917 and the remaining arm uh, was almost shattered as well. So I presume he never played the piano again. If we go to the right hand side, we see this wonderful profile photograph of Robert Graves. And I think he tells us in Goodbye to All That that he broke his nose boxing at Charterhouse there. So there we go. So from Goodbye to All That, uh, Graves moves to the 1st Battalion in Locon in November 1915, and he becomes second captain to Mervyn Strange Richardson. We've seen Mervyn up to his knees in mud at Frelinghuysen, and he, um, who penned the Christmas Truce ditty earlier. A day or two after I arrived, Graves writes, I went to visit C Company Mess, where I noticed the essays of Lionel Johnson lying on the table. It was the first book I had ever seen in France that was neither a military book nor a rubbishy novel. I stole a look at the flyleaf to see who could possibly be called Siegfried Sassoon. A few minutes later, we set out for Bethune, being off duty until dusk and talked about poetry. 1916, let's move to the Somme. Now, earlier on, I said that uh, we have a lot of poetry about battles, about events and such like, in all war poetry, and especially in the First World War, very rarely do we get the perspective on just one bog standard night out in the trenches, digging, repairing the wire, uh, with no battles or no raids going on whatsoever. So much is written about this, the First World War, as I said, taking part in great battles on the Somme, Passchendaele and Arras, but this night, the 18th and the 19th of March 1916, is special because we have three accounts by Sassoon, Graves and Bernard Adams that recollect the savagery of just life in the trenches on an ordinary night of the Somme. Sassoon and Graves also wrote some of their finest poetry because one of the men killed that night was their dear friend, Lieutenant David Thomas. So, again, please let me refer to goodbye to all that. One evening near Trafalgar Square, Richardson, David Thomas and I met Pritchard and the adjutant. That was Brian Reeves. We stopped to talk. Richardson commented on what a devil of a place this was for trench mortars. That's where I come in, said Pritchard, as battalion trench mortar officer. He had just been given two Stokes mortar guns. About time too, the adjutant said, we've had 300 casualties in the last month here. It doesn't seem so many as that because curiously enough, none of them have been officers. Oops. In fact, we've had about 500 casualties in the ranks since Lou's and not a single officer. Well, you know, shudder. He suddenly realized what he had said and that his words were unlucky. Touch wood. David shouted. You can read that in chapter 18. It's also recorded by, in Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams, and he uses pseudonyms for officers here. So no officer wounded since we came out in October, said Edwards. We're really awfully lucky, you know. For heaven's sake, I cried, touch wood. In Goodbye to All That, on that night, we know that Second Lieutenant David Cuthbert Thomas was killed on the 18th of March, 1916. Just after midnight, Captain Mervyn Strange Richardson was killed on the 19th of March, and shortly after that, Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant David Pritchard on the 19th of March, 1916. They're all buried at Point 110 New Military Cemetery at Free Corps on the Somme. And this is what Robert Graves had to say. I felt David's death worse than any other since I had been in France, but it did not anger me as much as Siegfried. And you can read about when they attended the funeral of the three men 
and goodbye to all that. Um, it's interesting because you have several different perspectives there in, in military memoirs uh, of a single night on the Somme where casualties, I, I think somebody told me once that casualties in the First World War were never less than 5,000 a week. I can't check that, but uh, it, it sounds, and this is just, uh, just one night on the Somme, but it's been recorded for posterity in these wonderful memoirs uh, written by uh, Sassoon and Graves. If you want to see, not necessarily a, a RWF memoir, but if you want to see a perspective from a mother, Ethel Richardson, who was Mervyn's mother, wrote a book called Remembrance Wakes, and you can see how uh, the war affected uh, the home front. She had two, two boys in the First World War, constantly sending out packages of, of goodies and, and writing letters and running around after them. And then you can read the very sad day that she gets the telegram where Mervyn has died. It's, a, it's an amazing book, it really is. Uh, this is a photograph I took, very cold March day. I think there's still snow on the top there of Point 110 New Cemetery at Freecore. And in, in the line from left to right is Thomas Richardson and Pritchard, literally how they fell. So uh, from this, we know that the, it was mentioned in the memoirs. Sassoud refers to it in his diary, not so much in memoirs of an infantry officer. Uh, Robert Graves wrote uh, the poem Goliath and David, and he refers to it in Goodbye to All That. From Sassoon, th th there were three poems, uh, a subaltern, the last meeting, and a letter home. And the, the, the incident is mentioned, but in not quite the same detail as memoir, in memoirs of an infantry officer. Um, Mamet's Wood, Again, I took that photo on, a, I think it was a misty morning at Mamet's Wood, which was quite, quite amazing. Uh, I refer to Llewellyn Wynne Griffith uh, before, who uh, joined the 15th, excuse me, but, uh, London Welsh Battalion, RWF. And here's a lovely profile picture of him as well. He looks amazingly like Hugh Laurie to me. Um, so this is one of the best books ever written uh, in the Western Front canon of literature. Unfortunately, though, he published it. Uh, there was a, a great sort of surge of publishing at the end of the 20s and the, um, the uh, first part of the 1930s up to about 1933 and this was published later on uh, and people unfortunately I think had sort of you know didn't want to buy any more or had read enough or such like uh, and this is not quite the classic that it should be but this is what he said about Mehmet's uh, reminding yourself that it is of course a wood I reached a cross ride in the wood where four lanes broadened into the confused patch of destruction fallen trees shell holes a hurriedly dug trench beginning and ending in a certain manner abandoned rifles broken branches a derelict machine gun propping up the head of an immobile figure in uniform with a belt of ammunition drooping from a breach into a pile of red stained earth this is the livery of war. Rather an amazing account. Uh, moving on again, too quickly, I'm afraid. Uh, this is David Jones, uh, perhaps better known as an, an artist. Uh, David Jones was born in 1895, so you see he looks awfully young there. Uh, and he survived the war. Uh, he has a record uh, of uh, in the RWF, or as a poet, I think, uh, or an author, of having spent 117 weeks on the Western Front. Um, he was born uh, in Broccoli in Kent, but his family were from Flintshire, and he, he was a Welsh speaker at home as well. He wrote uh, a book um, quite later on uh, in his life called In Parenthesis. Uh, it's a difficult book to read. Uh, uh, Faber published it with, with some bits and pieces at the end that you could refer to, but it is very much worth reading, and I can give you a small example of it here. Um, they lay with little sleep one more night in bivouac, and this is just before Mehmet's, and went again next day to that bewilderment of white worked foss and gallery, so that's the chalk of the Somme, artful traverse and well-planned shelter that had been his front system, so they've gone into the, the German system there. And in the afternoon, rain saw for the first time infantry go forward to assault. They wondered for the fate of each. Sometime during the night, they were moved by a guide into their own assembly positions. And this is what he said. 
last minute drums, it's taught millennium out. You can't swallow your spit and Captain Marlow yawns a lot. And seconds now are measuring rods with no juke juzo. I think that's a reference to Jesus, nor conniving God to stay the division synchronization. So that's the, 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 the you can't swallow yawning a lot. All of that is sort of very big nerves that are going on before going over the top. He was also an artist, and in our collection we have these wonderful uh, uh, um, drawings that he's done. He's done these in 1916 at Plug Street of rats, uh, many rats in the trenches, as we know. And here's, I think, a couple of soldiers by their braziers as well. So we also we don't just get an aspect of what the war was like through his poetry and literature, but we also get an aspect through his art as well. Um, Robert Graves, again, the harrowing, and this is so different from the Charge of the Light Brigade that we mentioned earlier on. Uh, he writes a poem called A Dead Bosch, and this is a little bit part of it. To you who read my songs of war and only hear of blood and fame, possibly Miss Pope, I'll say you've heard it said before, war's hell, and if you doubt the same, today I found in Mamet's wood a certain cure for lust of blood, where propped against a shattered trunk in a great mess of things unclean sat a dead Bosch. He scowled and stunk with his clothes and face a sodden green, big bellied, spectacled, crop haired, dribbling black blood from nose and beard. Very descriptive. Moving on, 1917. Major battles, Battle of Arras, that was Easter 1917, and then later on, uh, July into August to November, 3rd Ypres commonly known as Passchendaele, and we know that uh, uh, Sassoon wrote a poem about Passchendaele, though he wasn't actually there. Uh, 1917 is known as the coldest winter on record, something to do apparently with firing the guns all the time. The Germans retreated to the heavily fortified Hindenburg line and left destruction behind them and lots and lots of booby traps and things. Uh, Easter saw the Battle of Arras, and we get two well-known war poets were killed at Arras, Edward Thomas and Isaac Rosenberg. There was some success this time around at Vimy Ridge and also at Messines at Ypres. Uh, and third Ypres, Passchendaele ended in a very, very muddy stalemate uh, with very little gained. Palestine, Mesopotamia and Salonika were all still going on at the same time. So Sassoon wrote a poem called The General. Uh, good morning, good morning, the general said, when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at and most of them dead, and we're cursing his stall for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. Um, it's 106 years ago. Uh, almost to the day that uh, Sassoon made his declaration uh, against the war uh, that nearly got him court-martialed and of course where he ended up in Craig Lockhart, Hosp Craig Lockhart Hospital in Edinburgh where he met uh, Wilfred Owen. We'll come to that a little bit later on and uh, this sort of I think perfectly encapsulates uh, very epigrammatic, very short, very sweet uh, his feelings about the, uh, the way the war was going. Uh, there's a very famous picture of the duck boards at Passchendaele, uh, and here's a, a little map, uh, and there's, it's a north, the northeast part really, Vlamettinger, Boozinger, Langemark, uh, Popperinger was slightly out, it wasn't in the, the front line, Pulkapel, Passchendaele, Zonnebeek, all these places were, were, were fought over, uh, the casualties were horrific as well. And one of the casualties was Heath Wynne, uh, Private Ellis Humphrey Evans. Now, I've done a little bit of work here, a bit extra work on Hethwin, because I, I think for some, maybe he's a, maybe not that well known. So, uh, so bear with me. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy what I'm going to say here about, about this fantastic poet. Born the 13th of January 1887, so he's no, no youngster really at Trasfoneth. Uh, he was the eldest of 11 children. And shortly after he was born, the family moved to Erisgern, uh, to a farm that was about 130 acres of hill land. Now, I live on a, a hill farm and I know how hard that is to, to, to farm itself. It's not easy. He shared a talent for poetry early on and had composed his first poem by the age of 11. Nature, as we said, uh, this was very popular at the time, was a strong force in his poetry. 
and he was awarded his very first bardic chair at Bala in 1907. And I'm not sure if it's at that I said for, but he was given the bardic name of Hethwin, blessed peace, white peace, blessed peace. There's the family with some of the children. And uh, if we look a little bit further into his life, uh, he's becoming a, a well-known poet within Welsh culture of the Eisteddfod. In 1913, two chairs at uh, local Eisteddfod, Eisteddfod I. In 1916, he was second place at the National Eisteddfod at Aberystwyth. Um, conscription comes into force in January 1916, and by nature, he does not agree with the war. He's a pacifist and he is a farmer. There's, that is a memorial picture that is in the chapel that transformed it. So this is one of the most powerful pieces of war literature I've ever read in my life. And perhaps we don't concentrate so much on, on religion these days. Perhaps if you perhaps put the word morality in, uh, I think you might, might get a better meaning of it. But this is called Rival, which is Welsh for war. And it comes from the hero, the poem that, that won him, uh, uh, the Eisteddfod, we'll get to that in a minute. Alas, this is an age so mean that every one is made a lord for all authorities absurd when God himself fades from the scene. As quick as God is shown the door, out come the cannons and the sword, hate on hate on brother poured, and scored the deepest on the poor. The harps at once could help our pain, hang silent to the willow pinned. The cry of battle fills the wind, and blood of lads, it falls like rain. Very powerful. A Little bit more about his life, he's conscripted, in 1916, in fact, he went in place of his younger brother, Robert. He joined the 15th Battalion London Welsh, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, trained for a little bit at Litherland Camp. He was given seven weeks leave to help with the harvest whilst at Litherland. He wrote The Hero uh, during this leave, but he overstayed his leave and was arrested as a deserter. Uh, in June 1917, he joined the 15th Battalion at Flechin in Belgium. And it was here that he finished his poem, The Hero. And he sent this off by post for the 1917 National Eisteddfod that was to be held at Birkenhead that year. And he signed the entry Fleur de Lys. On the 31st of July, uh, this is the opening of the Battle of Passchendaele, Third Ypres. Uh, he took part in the first day, the Battle for Pilkham Ridge. He was wounded very early on in the battle. It's uh, not quite clear what happened to him. It seems that he had sadly took a stomach wound, which are never good. Excuse me, he died of his rooms, wounds, excuse me, about 11 a.m. There was another poet, war poet, killed that day. Again, not particularly well known, but sometimes might be known as Ireland's national World War I poet as well, Francis Ledwidge. And he was killed in an entirely different way. Uh, Hethwin was killed in battle. Francis Ledridge was having a cup of tea and just unfortunately a shell landed on the three of them that were working on the trench. Um, this is Artillery Wood Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery in Belgium. Um, and we, we took a wreath there uh, some years ago when I went to visit. That's Hethwin's grave. Uh, they're very fond of both poets in Belgium, both Ledwidge and, and Hethwin. And this is a little small exhibition, I think, in the, in the Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery. Um, people, as many people visit Francis Ledwidge's grave as they do uh, uh, Hethwin's as well, and leave little mementos as we did uh, for, for Hethwin. Um, back to the National Eisteddfod in 1917. Well, it's September when it's held, so we know that Heth Wynne has been killed in action. Uh, and chairing the bard ceremony was David Lloyd George, uh, who, of course, uh, comes from further down the Clint Peninsula, although born in Manchester. And he announced that the entry by Fleur de Lys, Heth Wynne, had won. The audience was informed that Fleur de Lys had been killed in action some weeks earlier. The chair was draped in black as a mark of respect. Uh, the Eisteddfod de Gavardi, the, uh, the black chair of the Eisteddfod, and the chair remains in the parlour at Erisgun at Trasfone today. So there, I think that's Geralt, his great nephew with the chair. It was carved, I think, by a Belgian. Uh, this is Bob. He went to visit uh, Artillery Wood Cemetery around about 1935 to lay a cross for his brother. 
That's Erez Gern, more in Heath Wednesday. Uh, today, uh, uh, well, we know it's a traditional Welsh farm, quite old, 1830s. Uh, there's 168 acres with woodland. It had grazing rights, as we all have up here for sheep. Uh, in just before COVID, St. Ionia National Park Authority was awarded a lottery grant. Uh, and that was to, uh, the, the place was beginning to fall apart and it's now been restored. It's a memorial to Heath Wynne and all the young Welshmen and women who died in the war. And I have to thank St. Ionia National Park for the, the, the pictures that they allowed me to use there as well. Uh, you can go there. It's got, you know, uh, all sorts of facilities these days. A little bit different when you'd get a cup of tea from Gareth. Uh, if you go to St. George's Chapel in Ypres, uh, the the uh, is like Mar is like a, a women's institute in Wales, uh, and they left a little uh, plaque for Heathwind in 1977. Uh, he's very popular in Belgium, incredibly popular as well. Hacky Boss, there's uh, this plaque and such like, and a Welsh flag is flying. And then, of course, if you do go to Langemark, you can see the second dragon that's now being uh, erected as a monument uh, to the 38th Welsh Division at Passchendaele uh, uh, in Belgium on the, the front, which I think is also absolutely amazing as well. And finally, this wonderful statue, if you're going to trust Funny, this lovely statue of Hethwyn, courtesy of a friend, Alan Fryer. So 1918. Uh, the great German offensive to break the deadlock on the Western Front begins. Ooh, Mr. T off there. Haig's backs to the wall message. So, you know, it's dire, really. This is the big battle. Whoever wins this is going to win the war. And then we get these final battles, these big moving battles of the Somme, the Aisne and the Marne. Uh, I mentioned Wilfred Owen a little bit earlier on. I, I always like to think of him as a sort of... Uh, um, almost a sort of friend of the RWF as well, or we were a friend of his. And you can see by his dates, it's well known that he died uh, a week before the end of the war, 1893 to 1918. Um, and Owen and Sassoon, uh, Sassoon's sent to Craig Lockhart Hospital because, you know, they, they say he's had a mental breakdown, shell shock. Uh, because after this declaration of war, um, they really, had two options it was either that or a court martial so so they meet at Craig Lockhart Hospital in Edinburgh they're both suffering from shell shock um, uh, Owen terrifically bad shell shock Sassoon had made his famous declaration as I said against the war being prolonged for profit uh, Robert Graves spoke up for his friend to state he was shell shocked and should not be court martialed but almost immediately the two poets the young poet and the established poet uh, um, set up a strong friendship at the hospital as well. Um, this is one of Owen's poems, and this is, this is he wrote this uh, to tell Jesse Pope that, you know, don't be so uh, jingoistic. This, this is his reply to her. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce et decorum es pro patria mori. It is meet and right to die for one's country. So that's a, a he issued that. Uh, against Jesse Pope's rather uh, jingoistic war poetry as well. There's lots of, uh, Sassoon added lots of changes to this. When you look at the original manuscripts, he certainly helped him with it. And again, that's, that's what I always sort of feel that there's a little bit of a connection between RWF and the Manchester Regiment with uh, Wilfred Owen. Owen's poems. Well, uh, Owen never lived really to see his success. Uh, he was killed in action on the 4th of November, 1918. It's well known that his parents, when the, when the bells were ringing out for the armistice uh, uh, to Oswestry, uh, his poor mother, Susan, uh, received a telegram telling him that her son had been killed. So he's killed during the battle to cross the Sambra Canal. Only five poems saw publication in his lifetime, three in The Nation, very much aided and abetted by Sassoon, and two in The Hydra that, were, um, that didn't have his name on it anyway. And this was a, a little newsletter that was produced by the patients of Craig Lockhart Hospital in Edinburgh. You can actually see them online. Sassoon was instrumental in ensuring that Owen's works 
did reach a larger audience with the publication of Poems, and this was edited by Sassoon in 1920 uh, for his friend. They had grown very, very close in, in that last year of, of the war. There's a picture I took at Orr's Cemetery, Orr's Communal Cemetery of Owen's uh, gravestone. You see, he was only 25. And I'm coming to the end of my talk now because I've nearly done an hour. Uh, and again, I can't do justice to everybody in an hour. And I hope uh, if you haven't been too bored by me, maybe I can come back and talk a little bit more about some of our other authors. I mentioned uh, uh, Captain John Dunn. Uh, in, who, who put together, I should say, the war the infantry knew. He wasn't a RWF officer, but he was a medical officer with the second battalion from about 1915 to 1918. Uh, Graves tells us that he virtually took over at one point. Uh, he's mentioned by both Graves and Sassoon in their memoirs and very much a respected, not only as a doctor, but as a soldier as well. He'd actually fought as a, as a trooper in the Boer War. Uh, the... War the Infantry New is a compilation of memoirs from officers and men who served throughout the war. It's completely unique. There's nothing like it anywhere else. Uh, and uh, uh, it is the go-to book for anybody that wants to learn what trench life was like uh, throughout the 1418 war. Uh, for those of you of a certain age, uh, you might like to know that he was a great uncle of John Dunn, the broadcaster, who I used to particularly like listening to on the radio. So I'd, I'd like, and, and John Dunn donated the medals uh, to the museum some, some time back now, I think, in the 70s or 80s. He's, sadly, John Dunn no longer alive. Uh, there is another book as well, uh, Will, William Albert Tucker, again, another view from the ranks. He was a volunteer in Kitchener's New Army. Uh, he didn't only serve on the Western Front, but also Italy and was taken prisoner. And the Lousier War, uh, you can pick up a copy of this quite, quite easily on, on uh, the internet. Uh, and then we have, and this really is a story for another time, I think, because uh, John Moore's book with Allenby's Crusaders introduces two, not just John Moore, who uh, uh, joined the 6th Battalion. Uh, I think he was at Gallipoli, if I remember right. Yes, uh, Egypt and then Palestine. And this is the, the Palestine part of the war. Uh, but it's got some, uh, he also wrote Dugout Doggerels. Uh, and these have some fantastic illustrations by Richard Lunt Roberts, who went on to be uh, a cartoonist for Punch and did jacket covers, for example, for Richmond Crompton as well, very famous for, uh, um, for her books on children. Uh, so that I think we're going to look at Lunt Roberts at another time. Uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about uh, um, John Moore as well, because time, I notice it's 8.02 now by my clock here. Um, I'll end with a poem. This is written after the war by Siegfried Sassoon. And I think it's a good way to end a talk anyway. Do you remember, it's called Aftermath, I should say. Do you remember the dark months you held the sector at Mametz? The nights you watched and wired and dug and piled sandbags on parapets? Do you remember the rats and the stench of corpses rotting in front on the front line trench and dawn coming dirty, white and chill with a hopeless rain? Do you ever stop and ask, is it all going to happen again? Have you forgotten yet? Look up and swear by the green of spring that you will never forget. So by the poetry, by the memoirs, by the letters, even the alphabet that uh, Captain Stable wrote, we are able to form a picture of the First World War through these wonderful poets and writers. And I hope that uh, if you already know them, I hope it's reminded you a little bit about them all. If you haven't come across some of them, I hope it's made you eager to look a little bit further as well. And I'm afraid that's really over and out for the talk for me. And I'm more than happy to take any questions if I can answer them. Thank you. Thank well, you Anne, thank so much, you. Anne. And thank you so much for that. Um, I, I knew it was going to be a, a, a smashing talk and really, um, just covered our most principal um, poets and authors um, so it's extremely well. So thank you so much for that. And um, we will definitely invite you back to talk about <laughs> the others, uh, Vivian de Sola Pinta, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I think, um, and we know now actually uh, more recently, just how many um, poets who were completely unknown, who we've discovered most recently had, were writing poetry as well. Do, I mean, do we think this is, 
very much just part of the Edwardian movement? Do we think this is part of the, um, yeah, a, 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 a movement within the RWF that led to so many people writing down their experiences? I don't think I've seen any particular um, sort of reference other than relationship between Sassoon, Graves and probably um, Frank Richards, that there was much collaboration going on in terms of um, capturing them. Have you seen any other or come across any other examples? I suppose Vivian de Sola Pinter and Sassoon were, were mm -hmm. very much sort of cooperating in that sense, but um, more broadly than that? Uh, well, we get with Vivian de Sola Pinter, I think, is it called the something that shines isn't it, it is the citadel shines. that shines isn't it yeah uh, he, he's he was very much an academic uh, and he does refer to to other poets within it as well i think the war was just a catalyst uh, what one thing we we don't perhaps understand today is that poetry wasn't really considered highfalutin uh to pre-war you know uh to, to pre-war people uh often even in a cottage there would be an anthology of poetry people, you know, sort of soaked up things like the Charge of the Light Brigade, Kipling's poetry. Kipling made an absolute fortune out of his poetry. Uh, it was bought the moment it was published. So I think that the, the idea that, that sort of poet is just, you know, poetry is just for, uh, you know, somebody that, that is very, very clever or, you know, has reached great heights in the poet, poetry world or something. This just all got thrown out the window with World War I. And uh, I mean, there are many other poets that you can refer to as well and certainly you know there's been some fantastic work done within our, our own uh, uh, museum archive here with uh, with poets that we, we didn't even know you know existed so it, it wasn't unusual for people to turn to poetry and do remember it's a world you know we live in a busy world there's uh, television there's the internet there's radio there's films uh, people could actually sit down, think about things and write something. And even if it wasn't the best poetry in the world, it still recorded something. It still gives us uh, uh, an idea of what happened, uh, maybe on a special occasion, if, if that be war or if it be something else. So, so I would say that, you know, the, the, the war was a catalyst, um, but people were used to poetry and they just had to get this information out there. No going on, you know, YouTube or you know, Twitter these days, it's awful in the trenches, you know, isn't it terrible? Uh, you can't do that. So th this was another way. And it was just, uh, you know, the, the tragedy of war is just, just too much sometimes. Anyone that's been to the Western Front and has seen the rows and rows and the cemeteries uh, of soldiers that didn't come back, it, it almost, you, you can't take it in. You can't take it in. And this is a way that people were able to, to, to sort of put that out really out there for largely a public that didn't really know what was happening on the western front and beyond yeah. does that help yeah thank you um sorry valerie i think i interrupted you um, do you want to come in and, and if you could manage um people's questions i'm sure there are um, some out there yes i had two that just came through to me um one of them is kind of an obvious one which what's your favorite i know that's a difficult it's probably the oh. most difficult one but <laughs> that's one of the questions we got well I, I probably think, I, I can't tell you that I've got a favourite because I turn to all of them. Um, I think though that one that strikes me most is that small section from Hethwin in Rival. And again, if you, if you just take out, I mean, he was very religious uh, in a you know, very much a Welsh way, uh, uh, the chapel way. And um, if, we, if I just put the word morality, I just think he got it. He got why wars were fought and who got people to fight wars as well. Uh, so I can't, I cannot pick out a favourite. I pretty much, Aftermath, that's just a, one of the stanzas from Aftermath. And I can feel, when I read that out, I could feel Sassoon's anger that this war must never come again. Goodness knows what these men felt like in 1939 when another war started. You know, had it all been for nothing, and I think he actually writes a poem that does say that later on. Yeah. So, so that, that, that is that that, that, that I, I can't pick one. I'm afraid. I wish I could. <laughs> I think though the incident at uh, um, in March, at Free Corps, I find that fascinating. I find that absolutely fascinating that that, that it was recorded, 
And it, it all ties in. I, I actually was able to make a map uh, of everything that happened and put people in, because there is more, you know, I was only choosing a little bit to, to put out on the, 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 the um, slide, but uh, uh, I could actually make a map of everything that happened that night. Uh, it, it was amazing, really. And it was, you know, in a sense, you, with when you have poets that were officers and poets and authors that were in the ranks, it's amazing how often their experiences concur. So you know it's the truth. You know, you know, you know it's the truth. It's, it's brilliant. There we go. The one was, do you know if there are any amateur or unpublished artists within our collection or poetry within our collection? Uh, well, a short answer to that is, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the, 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 we have been, uh, there's been, um, as you know, probably might have come, not come across it yet, Valerie, but I'm sure you will. Uh, there's, we have been collecting these sort of forgotten poets or, I mean, you've only got to look at some of, you know, Loscombe Law Stable, you know, the little alphabet ditty. Uh, it's not published, of course, and it, it, only, it was only ever put in a memorial volume to remember the sun, you know, in a, in a lighter moment. But um, uh, yeah, I'm sure there is more out there. I mean, you know, we're still finding things written about uh, the Romans, so I'm sure that there's more, more out there, you know, so definitely. Hope so, anyway, I hope we can find some more. Yeah. Matt? Hi. Hello, Matt. Hello. Hi. Thank you. I mean, that was a tour de force. Oh, of course, thank you. <laughs> You've obviously got lots more you could share. Oh, so I could go on for hours if you want to stay. <laughs> please do, please do. But um, I just wondered for, the, for a question, if maybe this already exists or if you've considered, you know, putting together some kind of compendium of all these fantastic poets together, um, that, you know, that could be published, you know, for the regiment or for the museum that would be, I'm sure, very popular. I, I would love to, uh, but as you know, uh, in the world today of publishing, um, we've got to find a publisher to do that. <laughs> and, uh, that isn't always the easiest. I'm really hoping now that Valerie's come as our, our, our new director, uh, that, that we, we can get some things out to the friends. You know, this is why we want the friends group that we want to, to you know, there's always a lot in the archive. Our, a, a museum is like an iceberg. Uh, you see the tip of the iceberg in the museum. Uh, but you don't see, you know, what we've got in the archive. And sometimes you can't put things out in an archive. You know, they're either too uh, big or too small or just not relevant or, or you know, they're, 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 there's a problem with, you know, that they might be a bit fragile. But uh, so we're hoping really through the friends. My, 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 my big hope is that I can tell you a little bit more about the Middle East because that's, that's my big uh, sort of interest. I mean, the whole lot is interesting to me, but I'm very interested in Gallipoli and Palestine as well. Uh, my, my hometown was, was hit quite hard by Gallipoli. So, um, and uh, uh, the exhibition I did was actually the Welsh at Gallipoli, not the Quarry Boys. And you, I think you can still get that online now at um, oh, People's Collection Wales, if you want to have a look at it, it's free. Um, but, you know, I'm really interested to see, and I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of ditties about Suvla Bay, but I'm sure somebody somewhere must have written some poetry as well. So, yeah, I mean, the answer to that, Matt, is I'd love to. Yeah. Anything else? One of the many projects I'm going to put Anne on. <laughs> <laughs> and thank just... you, Nick dropping that blog in um for lucy london's blog forgotten poets of world war one that's really yeah, that's the one I, I couldn't remember lucy's name but uh but yeah that, that's one that, that and i think you you put that quite often uh on facebook is it yeah so yeah. It, it, it's uh, it's on our social social media but social um, media. she's done uh, quite a lot of work uh, and there are a number of um rwf poets on there uh, mm. And uh, General Jonathan has also um, done some work on the, uh, the the really obscure and forgotten poets. Um, and musicians as well. Constant yeah. Lambert. <laughs> Is there any mic can sort of interrupt in this one? It's William Graves. Hello, William. Uh, am I am I seen? Am I anyway? I can't. I, I don't know how to use this. I, I can't see you on mine. Can you bring him up? Uh, I can see you. There we go. Can you? There we anyway, go. No, this, the, the first oh, thing. Oh, there's William. I can see you there. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. I'm confused because I, the, there's a a section in in the in goodbye to all that where um, a couple of soldiers get uh, sort of, uh, punished for, for for spilling Welsh with a, with the S rather than the C yeah. doing that. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I can refer to Nick for this if you want, or, or I can mm -hmm. try and answer it myself. Nick, you go, because you, you, you're, you're a you know, serving officer at the moment. Uh, let, let's hear it from, from, from you. Yeah? Well, I think the, um, uh, certainly officially in the First World War, it was spelt with an S uh, by um, you know, the, um, uh, the War Office, but uh, it wasn't until, I think, 1921 that it was officially it was Army order, wasn't it? There we go. The, um, to, to the C um, a spelling, uh, which we maintained uh, until we amalgamated with the Royal Regiment of Wales in um, two, uh, 2006. So that that was, uh, I think, but there was there was use of the CH spelling um, oh, definitely. during the First World War as well, although it was not officially sanctioned, I think is the, the party line. It was pure, pure, I mean, the adjutant that, you know, that sort of runs the battalion uh, and would probably write up the war diaries and such like, uh, it was at the discretion of the adjutant, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, you know, if you had a particular adjutant that, that liked the, the spelling W-E-L-C-H and uh, maybe somebody referred to it in the way I did, uh, E-L-S-H, uh, maybe they, they got told off for that. I, I chose the, the, that, that because I, I see it mostly uh, in World War One. so I, I thought, and it gives us a, it's the most asked question I ever have at talks, that's why there are two <laughs> diff, different spellings of Welsh, and I thought I'd got round it a bit there, William, I thought I got but round it's done, it a little it, bit it, it goes way back into, uh, mm. of course, Robert, uh, Robert Gray wrote no, this, the, the, the story of um, Sergeant Lamb, Yes, yeah. It goes yeah. way back. It goes way, way back, back yes. Yeah, so. it, it is just archaic and, spelling, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Mm. And, and the other thing, of course, Robert did was to was to write um uh what's the private um Tommy Atkins. Uh, no, no, the one one you mentioned. He he rewrote those. The um Frank Richards. Ta Frank, Frank Richards. Richards. Oh, Frank yeah, Richards, yeah, yeah. Yes, Ron, yeah, Ron yeah. wrote those. I mean, again, you know, there, there's mm -hmm. another story there that, the, you yes. know, the friendship between the two of them. We have some lovely letters, absolutely brilliant letters in the archive between the, the friendship. Uh, and, you know, Frank Richards, uh, you know, I think, you know, mining family from Blyner uh, in South Wales. And look, you know, how, how descriptive he is in his books. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And Robert saw that. He saw that talent uh, and he absolutely, matured yeah. it. So, you know, amazing piece of work to get those two books out, I think. Uh, We're going to keep you pretty busy then, Anne, because it seems like there's so much more content <laughs> to pull from here. And I don't mind. I don't mind. About it. So I'll start working on that next one with you, but mm -hmm. we'll end this one for now since we're getting pretty late. But thank you guys all for joining us this evening. Um, thank you all. Yeah. Enjoyed it. <laughs> Um, and if you enjoyed tonight's talk, I'd really encourage you to come to the museum and visit some of our poetry collection in the museum. We have an impressive collection related to today's program, including some stuff from Robert Gray, Siegfried Sitsun, David Jones. We have a bardic chair from Private William Williams from Anglesey. Um, and in the next few weeks, we're going to be adding our newest donation to the collection, which is going to be a medal set from Llewellyn Wynne Griffiths. So once that's um, online, we'll announce it. Once that's in sight, we'll announce it on our social media channels, and we'll hope you'll come by and visit it. And several of the artworks um, and the photographs that Anne used tonight are actually available. Um, you can look at them through our Art UK platform or our Ogilvy Muster platform, and both of those are available on our website. But if you have any trouble finding them, just shoot me an email, and I'll happily send you the links. Um, I have a I have a, a gift for for the museum, which hopefully this. This autumn will, will come to you. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's tantalizing, William. One of the brigadiers at uh, Brigadier Vivian's um, think, uh, 90th said it, it was going to be, it was so important we would put next to uh, Sassoon's uh, pistol, um, raw, whatever it is, pistol, I suppose. So, anyway. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's, it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. I'm re really pleased you all enjoyed it. So, especially with the peer group there as well. So. <laughs> thank you. And you, William. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, with that audience, and there's no pressure, is there? <laughs> no, but I, I'm I'm very happy to talk about it. So it's um, it's a real it's been my life's work this to war poetry. So there we go. Well, my son's been up to uh, the, the museum a couple of times, but I haven't been there yet. Well, we would love to see you, William. 
Well, when we last met, met William, I did say, if you ever do come this way, you'll be more than welcome to come and stay in my lovely mountain home as well. So do please, if you find yourself there and I'll take you, I'll take you to the museum. Then. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Much, uh, much appreciated uh, this evening. We will definitely get Anne back to talk about <laughs> the lesser known poets uh, in the future. Uh, and um, please, if you can get to it, um, save the date, 7th of October, RWF Fest uh, at Hightown Barracks, the historic home of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Uh, and um, we very much hope to see you there. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, right. I'll thank just, you. Good night, I'll everyone. hang on and. and...